Alessandro De Stefani, thank you so much for joining me on this virtual visit uh, where we get to talk about you and your wines and share with all of the customers across uh, the country. Thank you. Hello, Brian. Hello, everybody. I'm so glad to be here uh, to present you and to speak about our family, our winery and our wines together. And then uh, we can taste the wines together. Absolutely. Yeah. Just to kind of outline how this virtual visit goes is we yes. will talk about you, talk about your history, how you began, where you're located and um, kind of how you farm the different practices. And then what we'll do is we'll taste through this amazing range of wines that we currently stock, we have in, in right now. And if anything is intriguing to you who want to taste, um, just ask us for samples and we'd love to do that for kind of the fall season. So that's kind of the way it goes. Um, yeah. Al Alessandro, so to start off, will you tell me um, just about you and how you began? how did you start winemaking? What's your family history? Yes. So I'm the fourth generation of the De Stefani family. Uh, we are basically located in Veneto, in the northeast of Italy. Uh, and in, uh, my, great -grand uh, my great grandfather, Valeriano De Stefani, started in 1866 in an area which is called, which is in the Treviso area. Uh, and, uh, and now the winery, uh, we also have vineyards in Treviso, but we also have the winery in Venice, Venezia, and also vineyards in the Venezia area. But the origin was up in the hills, 50 kilometers north of Venice, uh, in the Conegliano Valdobbiadene area, which okay. became a UNESCO World Heritage uh, last year, last summer. Really? And for the beauty of the hills, it's a fantastic area. Oh, you and mean they this? Are like, yeah. <laughs> this is, it, yeah, it's ridiculous. It's so gorgeous there. I did not know yeah. it was UNESCO World Heritage now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's UNESCO since last year. And um, there, in the little house you can see on the top left of the oh, picture. Right here. Yeah, like there. Uh, my, uh, my family uh, started, my great-grandfather started. And then uh, he was the first generation and then there was the second generation. And then the third generation was my father, who studied in the wine enological school in Conegliano, just five kilometers from this picture, uh, the oldest winemaking school, and that I also did. He graduated in 1958, I graduated in 1992, and my eldest son, Marco, is going to start in one month the same school as a university of viticulture and winemaking. So there will be three it. generations of the De Stefani family in the same school. I love yeah. it. I love it. That's, <laughs> That's amazing. Cool. Yeah, we are very really excited about that. Yeah. yeah, this is the area where uh, we started. Here we produce the Prosecco, uh, mainly Prosecco Glera grapes. And that's the old house that you can see where my family started. And then my father, uh, who is now 85 years old, he's still with me in the winery. From here in the 60s, he wanted to produce uh, red wines, but he right. didn't have a great experience because, you know, this is an area for Prosecco and the only red, gri red grape we produced here is Marzemino. So he went to Bordeaux in France to learn a new technique, how to produce good red wines and he fell in love with Pomerol. So after three years of experience there in 1961, he came back to Italy and he wanted to find a terroir which was similar to Pomerol. And he bought the land we have now in Fossalta di Piave, which is along the river Piave, down uh, towards the sea, close to Venice. And yeah, that area. And in the uh, lower part is where we are located, quite close to the sea. Cool. And it's very similar to Pomerol because it is at the same latitude, uh, 50, 50.5 uh, parallel. And cool. as, uh, close to the sea, we have the Mediterranean Sea. They have the Atlantic Ocean. We have the Piave River. They have the Dordogne River. The soil is the same, which is clay. And also the altitude is the same because we, it's quite flat. It's close to the sea. Uh, whereas, yes, these are the pictures of the estates we are talking about in uh, Fossalta di Piave. Piave is the river. And the altitude here is, is only uh, 20, 25 meters from the sea level because we are only 10 kilometers from the sea. 
Right. But then in, in the other vineyards, in the hills of Refrontolo, the Conegliano Valdobbiadene area, we are at 250 meters above sea level. Well, so it really goes up quickly. It really goes up quickly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that is basically from here where I am now, the winery is in Fossalta di Piave, is 35 kilometers. And so it's, it's not very far away. Fantastic. And then I joined the winery in 1991, uh, one right. year before graduated in, in, in enology. And I started with first, my task was winemaking. I learned how to produce wine in the winery. Then I also took care of the vineyard management and then also sales and, uh, and then everything, you know. So it's already, um, yeah, it's a long time. Almost 30 years I'm in the winery and uh, we love it. My kids, I have three kids. They, will all, they all want to follow this uh, activity. They want to be in the family business. I'm glad. So I hope uh, really in, in a few years we can have a, a big family team working together for the wines. It's amazing. And, and just to interject, yeah. Alessandro's kids and family are amazing. Uh, they're so enthusiastic, much like you, Alessandro. And, <laughs> and it's, so, it's so lovely to see all three children are really excited about the yeah. winery and what you do there and how you're, how you're working and how you're making wine. It's so cool. It's so cool. Um, so tell, tell, me, uh, tell me about your farming while we're talking about the vineyards. What do you, how do you yeah. farm? So uh, the vineyards are basically located in the, the two areas are both between the sea level, the sea and the mountains, the Dolomites, which are just at the back. Uh, we have some vineyards which are very close to the sea, 10 kilometers in the Fossalta di Piave. Mm -hmm. And the uh, hilly vineyards are just at the foot of the Dolomites. They are uh, 40 kilometers from the sea. So there are two different terroirs. The farming is organic in, in all our vineyards. We don't use pesticides, we don't use chemical fertilizers, no herbicides and no insecticides. We plant cover crop among the rows of the vineyards in autumn. We, uh, we plant uh, um, peas, sunflower, beans, grapes, and other uh, grasses that in spring grow then they flower, so they attract loads of good insects in, in spring. So uh, we stimulate, you know, the uh, different uh, uh, insects in the vineyards. They defeat these diseases. They stimulate the immune system of the vine. And then basically when it's uh, end of May, beginning of June, we cut this cover crop, we leave it there. So it creates a sort of blanket to maintain the humidity of the soil and the moisture and then they uh, bring natural fertilization to the soil. Very cool, yeah. very cool. So, so we are very excited about this way of farming. We started more than 20 years ago with the first experiments of, you know, organic farming. And now we are fully organic and we also, you know, like to uh, also follow some biodynamic principles. And so uh, to, be, to be as natural as possible. Also, we don't like to manipulate the, the, the characteristic of the vintage. So we like to, to, to the, not to manipulate the grapes too much, mm -hmm. just to deliver what nature delivers to the grapes, to deliver that in the bottle. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful. Yeah. And I mean, as, as, as many people who are probably watching this right now know, the, the Redentore line has been so successful across the country. And, and I think it's really all about this wonderful philosophy you have, um, but also, um, just how, how the whole package comes together. Not only is it delicious, but it also, you're, you're doing it right. You're farming correctly and you're bringing in the winery and really letting it express itself. So um, with that being said, let's, let's taste some wine. I, I shared one picture, but you know, just to kind of reiterate, Alessandro's history is really up in the hills of Conegliano and Valdebiadene. And this, this you know, picture with the background of all the vines these are all different sparkling wines of the estate of De Stephanie and Redentore, um, which, which is so cool. And because that's really where your history comes from is why you have so many delicious options. But we'll start with something I think is very, very delicious and fun. And it's only nine in the morning for me. So this is my favorite breakfast wine. Um, <laughs> But uh, we'll start with uh, your Colfondo. Will you, will you talk about the Colfondo? And I can, I can kind of start to show 
show yeah. how this works. Another thing to say, this is a perfect wine for breakfast, so you are lucky. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you are uh, moving gently the bottle in order to let the yeast uh, get up and um, uh, really uh, mix in the, in the, in the bottle. And, um, uh, you know, it's a natural way of... Can you see me? Yes, of course. All right, great. Uh, so it's a natural way of um, uh, producing this Prosecco. This is uh, the old way of making Prosecco. It's 100% Clara grapes. And uh, uh, Prosecco uh, can be done uh, with a natural fermentation in tank, which is the way we normally do it today. But in the old times, the fermentation, the second fermentation was done in bottle. And the whole history is that in September, the grapes were harvested. There was the first fermentation. And then since the harvest at that time was a little bit later than now, now we harvest glera for Prosecco, let's say in, in the beginning of September, middle of September. At that time was in October, so it was cooler temperature. And sure. then the fermentation was a little bit slower, you know, with natural yeasts and it went up at, uh, up till uh, November. Uh, but then in November, it was a little bit colder. So the fermentation naturally uh, stopped with a little bit of residual sugar in the wine. Okay. And then the wine was uh, kept in, in the casks or in the tanks. And then in the next spring, the wine was bottled with this small residual sugar natural of the, of the grapes. And then in spring, in bottle, uh, when the temperature came up uh, again, uh, the second fermentation started uh, creating the bubbles, consuming the residual sugar, transforming it into uh, sparkling wine and into uh, a little bit of alcohol. And then the yeasts stayed in the bottle, like a champenoise fermentation, you know, traditional right. bottle fermentation. Uh, but then the tradition was to use a, a crown cap, not right. to use cork. So uh, it's, we use it as a tradition. And it is technically it's perfect because there is no loss of pressure, no oxidation of the wine, no need to add sulfites. So these wines are produced without added sulfites. And so um, we deliver the wine with yeast inside. So the wine is actually cloudy. It's uh, very, very natural. And also the taste is a little bit better. You can add something about this, but I wanted just to say that normally, you know, Prosecco is fresh, fruity, and clean, and fragrant. In yeah. this case, is a little bit less fruity and less floral, but this wine is more yeasty, has a little bit more body, is more rustic, but this is the original Prosecco, way of making it. And col fondo means with sediment. With so sediment. So with yeast at the bottom of the bottle. And this is, this is the 2018 vintage, uh, and this is yeah. what we currently have in stock. And will we get more of this on the next time we need Cofondo? Yes, 18? yes, 18. What I love about this wine is the longer it ages too, it, it develops, all that yeast kind of continues to develop the palate. Um, right now, this is so fresh, it's so vibrant, but it still has this wonderful kind of lazy character to it. It's stony, it's bone dry. That's what I also like about Cofondo, yeah. is yeah. so many people in America, um, Prosecco is sweet in their minds, and Colfondo Prosecco is so dry. It's, it's really the, the opposite of Prosecco in many people's minds. And yeah. don't forget that we can call this Petnat. You know, in the, we now see restaurants and retail shops across the country that have an entire Petnat section, and Colfondo Prosecco can fit in that ancestral method of sparkling production. You know, so... Um, so this is 100% Glera. Now, what about the Rosato or the Rosé? Yes, the Rosato, the Rosé, col fondo, also with sediment. You can see it's completely cloudy in, in the wine. And it's made um, with uh, Raboso grape, which is a typical grape of Venice. Raboso comes from the Italian word rabioso, that means angry, because this wine uh, that can also be made in red version is, is quite aggressive at the beginning because it has natural loads of acids and loads of tannins, yeah. which, which are perfect for aging the wine. 
In this case, we don't have tannins, obviously, because we, we don't have skin contact or a very, very short skin contact. We press the grapes almost immediately after a few hours of skin contact just to have this pale rosé color. But the acidity is there, and the acidity is absolutely very important for this wine, uh, which is the last grape we harvest in our area. We harvest it at the end of October because okay. it uh, ripens very late. And uh, it has this marvelous color, uh, this uh, fizziness that gives a really uh, vibrant acidity to the wine, lively. And this, I love this wine. Yeah. And this wine pay, uh, pairs really fantastic uh, local food we have, especially um, hams and prosciutto and uh, salami, soppressa, which is typical from this area. And also some local cheeses. We love it with piave cheese and also with the Parmesan and extra old Piave cheese. So really extra old cheese. Cool. But then try it also with blue cheese, Gong Gorgonzola. It's amazing. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. I, I haven't had that pairing. I yeah. That. This, yeah. when you say prosciutto, I feel like this is liquid prosciutto. <laughs> like yeah, liquid almost, prosciutto. Almost if you take prosciutto and wrap it around uh, cantaloupe or melon, um, yeah. that, that essence of flavor, you have this wonderful kind of round juicy fruit while being kind of this neat, I don't want to say funky. It, it has it has some freshness and and wildness to it, but it's it's so good. It's delicious. Um, so yeah, the, so everyone knows this is one that we actually pretty much order twice a year, and so it's a little bit more allocated or at least a more special order style. Um, this I don't believe we have in stock. We do have some bottles for samples but usually this goes right out to distributors. So maybe it's already in your market, but um, I love this wine. It's so cool. Yeah. And it's I just wanted to add about these two wines that uh, normally for Prosecco, we suggest uh, to our importers and to our distributors and restaurants and shops, not to order too big quantity of Prosecco to place more, but frequent orders. Yeah. in order to and we always deliver freshly bottled prosecco because you know in prosecco you want to have freshness fruitiness yeah. and it has to be young yeah but in this case with cold foam is totally opposite the wine staying with the lees with the yeast in the bottle it becomes richer uh, the yeast uh, act as a natural antioxidant so the yeah. wine can also age for really for years but for many many years so uh, don't be afraid to have this wine which is, you know, three, four, five, eight years old, because it's always better and better and better. I, lo I love it. I, I actually have a few of yeah. the old bottles in my cellar still. And when I open them, I, I absolutely love it. The color is darker, it's richer, but the flavor yeah. is exceptional. And next time you come, or guys, you distributors come uh, to my place, uh, we will all open, we will do a vertical tasting of these wines, like uh, 10 years old, six years old, and you really, really realize how this, how this wine develops and, and shows its richness in, in a few years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Alessandro, now we'll taste, we'll talk about the Redentory name in just a bit, but yeah. we're starting now with a classic, more classic style Prosecco, the Redentore Prosecco. Tell me about this. Redentore Prosecco, this is more classic, you know, this is the classic way of doing it today. So we harvest the grapes in September, we have the first fermentation in stainless steel tank at low temperature to maintain the freshness, the acidity. We don't go through malolactic. It's very important not to have any uh, step of the malolactic fermentation in Prosecco because you don't want to have lactic acid, but only, only malic acid to keep the freshness and the fragrance of the grapes. And then uh, we store the wine and depending on sales at a certain point, we put the wine in, in tank uh, we use our natural yeasts. We can talk in a while ab about our yeasts. And we have this second fermentation in, in pressurized tank in autoclave. And then the wine becomes sparkling. So at that point, we keep it on the lease not for a long, for a long time, you know, more, not more than 30 days after okay. the end of the fermentation. Otherwise, we get a yeasty flavor that we don't want in this case, but we want to keep the fruitiness of the wine and then we bottle and deliver it immediately. So it's very fresh, clean. We like to say very precise and yeah. vertical. How yeah. much sugar is on this? This is the 2019 vintage current release. This is the Brut, 
Here, the sugar is between eight and 10 grams per liter. More often is 10, eight grams per liter, eight. And the acidity is so fresh and so yes. laser-like that the, the perception of sweetness is really just fruity. It's, it's very just delicious and easy drinking versus kind of sweetness with acidity. It's, it's yeah. one package. Yeah, we pay a lot of attention to the acidity, uh, the freshness of the wine. This is the reason why we don't want any malolactic. In the white wines, we can have a little start of the malolactic, but not in the Prosecco, because when you have it, you lose acidity, you lose freshness, and you lose flavors, which is, gotcha. which is the Prosecco. <laughs> you don't want to lose yeah. any of those things. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, in Prosecco, we don't, want, we don't want body, we don't want fatness, you know, we don't want complexity, but we want an easy drinking wine, you know, it's the most consumed sparkling wine in the world. Yeah. Uh, 10 years ago, we overtook champagne consumption, and that was the level of 300 million bottles in the world. And champagne was first, we overtook uh, champagne, and then now Prosecco is 600 million bottles in the world. So it's wow. a huge success, still growing a lot. And people say, why is Prosecco so successful? Very simple. Prosecco is an easy drinking wine. Uh, Prosecco uh, is liked by men and women, young people, old people. You can drink it as Brian is doing in the morning or in the night <laughs> as an aperitif or with food. It's not an expensive wine and it's a very happy and lively wine. You know, it's uh, good for any toast, any good occasion. It really is. I, I yes. absolutely love it. And, and this has been such a fun wine to sell. It's so successful. The packaging's amazing. Um, it's, it's been great. So yeah. Thank you. Let's, let's talk about your three white wines. Um, yes. We have Pinot Grigio, we have Chardonnay, and we have Sauvignon Blanc. Um, all from your vineyards right there near the winery, correct? Exactly. Uh, the vineyard uh, that is just next to me, and I'm going to show you, it to you in, in a while. Oh, yeah, you have Pinot Grigio. Have Good, Pinot so Pinot. I'm just now, just moving into the Pinot Grigio with my laptop, uh, and I want to show you, because today is the 19th of August, and next Monday, today is, is Wednesday, so in a few days, we will start the harvest of the Pinot Grigio, which is actually the first grape we harvest, and just oh. jumping out of the window, <laughs> okay, yeah, and this is the vineyard. Let, let I want to show you the estate. You see, this are this is the vineyard, okay, which is just uh, ripening a little bit more. We have a wonderful weather. This is going to be an amazing vintage. So far, we had uh, a warm temperature, not too hot and not too cool, and we had the right amount of rain. Uh, the the grapes are perfectly healthy, and uh, I hope you can see it. Uh, oh, yeah. That's yeah, this, this, this is the Pinot Grigio, you see, this is the Pinot Grigio grape, Beautiful. and it's, it's perfect. The bunch is, uh, the berries are really full, are ripe. Uh, we made this morning the first analysis. We have acidity, pH, which is perfect. Sugar level is already very high. So in five days, we will start harvesting this Pinot Grigio. You see, this is the row of the Pinot Grigio, wow. ready to be harvested and all the grapes i hope you can see it well yeah yeah it's 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 perfect the light is perfect we might lose your internet though you're walking away from the light go back to the light <laughs> well well while alessandro is frozen and, and trying to walk back to the building um his 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 whites are really really cool and i want him to talk about the kind of yeast the, the way that they work with yeast there, because it's pretty interesting and really kind of special. Um, and there, there he is, he's back, <laughs> I think. Um, and his, his whites have a real beautiful kind of linear, linear palette to them at the same time as being distinctly different. And Alessandro, can you tell me, um, talk about yeast, how do you do yeast there? Yes, so yeast is a very important uh, factor for our wines. I can tell you a little bit the history we were doing before and how we do now. So, okay, back, back like 30 years ago, we were using as 99% of the wineries are doing here, 
select the yeast, you know, commercial yeast, you buy them from your suppliers, you select the yeast you like and you use it. But you know, there is a little bit more, too much standardization in the wines and other wineries that use the same yeast you use might have similar wines. So we didn't like that. So we started with spontaneous, totally spontaneous fermentation and uh, you know with wild yeast of our vineyards and uh, one year the wine was were great the next year the wine were not so good maybe uh, just because depending on the the strain of yeast which we are starting the fermentation so we said okay we cannot work in this way but we want to work with our natural yeast so we started a, a, a huge work of six years in which we picked different grapes when they were ripe, put them in some uh, uh, sterilized uh, bucket uh, with the laboratory uh, specialized in yeast production near here. We create, we uh, identified all the yeasts we had in our vineyard. We selected the best ones. And then year after year, we did also in winter micro vinifications with different yeasts from our vineyard. And at the end, we selected the two best strain of yeast coming from our vineyard. One was coming from the Glera up in the hills of uh, Refrontolo, Conegliano, Valdobbiadene. And the second one is from Raboso here in Fossalta. And um, uh, now we keep the mother of the yeast at minus 80 degrees, frozen. Okay. Before the harvest, we take it out, we multiply it, we create the yeast we need for the fermentation for the harvest, and then the mother goes back at minus 80 degrees for next year. So in this way, we have the advantage of working with our own yeast, indigenous yeasts coming from our vineyards, and they are selected by us. So we are sure that the, the work they're doing, so the fermentation and the flavor the yeast are creating in the wine, are great and we are so happy of this way of working we put a lot of effort a lot also it's big investment for us because it's a big work and uh, we are very happy so in this way we have a, lo a local grapes and uh, native yeast but quality high quality result in the wine Cool. I, I love it and i and i want i always want people to understand kind of the way that you do yeast because um, it's not totally spontaneous fermentation, but it's using something that is so specific to De Stephanie and Redentore that I think it's it's very special and and worth noting. Um, exactly. So, yeah. Alessandro, with your white wines, I've just tasted through all three. Um, tell me about vinification. What do you? What is so, the vinification? We bring the grapes in. We put them directly into the press, so we don't have the stemming, uh, but we have whole bunch pressing. Uh, to maintain, not to have oxidation. We also have, uh, since last year, we have a new press which is filled with nitrogen before putting the grapes, <laughs> not to have contact with oxygen. And then from that moment till the moment we bottle the wine, the wine never gets in contact with the air. So we don't have oxidation at, at all the old way. And um, after pressing, uh, the juice goes into a tank we have static clarification for one night. The day after we rack the juice to another tank where we add our yeast and we have a fermentation at low temperature. And then the wine stays in that tank till the moment we bottle it. We never and rack. In the steel tank? No, it's a cement. Cement, cement tank. For the white wines, but also the red wines, the vinification is all done in cement. In concrete, okay. To allow a slight, very little micro-oxygenation. So in this way, after the end of the fermentation, we don't rack the wine, but we keep it on the full lease, not even taking away any, any yeasts, which is very important to us. So in cement, there is a slight micro-oxygenation, not to have too much reduction in the wine. Sure. but to keep it in a good balance with oxygen and reduction. And uh, it stays there for basically six months. We stir it twice a week, batonnage, in order to mix, it, mix the yeasts with the wine to give more richness and more flavor to the wine. Mm -hmm. And then after six months, we have, again, we don't uh, stir the wine, so we have a static clarification. We just rack to another tank and then we bottle. Okay. And, uh, all the way through, we never add sulfites. Wow. 
Wow. So we use nitrogen when we rack the wine, we fill the tank where the wine goes uh, with nitrogen, we fill the pump, the hoses, everything, not to have oxidation. And in this way, we are able not to add any sulfite, no other sulfites is, is written in all the labels. Yeah. Uh, because in this way, we really have, in my opinion, two or three big advantages. The first one is that the yeast doing the fermentation without other sulfites, they, uh, because sulfites is some, in somehow against yeasts, they can work free, more freely, they can really produce finer flavors and they can make better aromas in the wine. Yeah. And then it's good for the final consumer uh, because you know, some people are intolerant to sulfites, headaches, you know, stomach and digestion. And then at the end, the wine, we say is more open. So also in the red wines, but in the white wines too, when you open the wine, you don't need to wait, you know, one hour, two hours for the opening of the wine, but the wine is immediately open because the sulfite in somehow close the wine, but without sulfites, the wine really is very fruity and very open and really shows everything. There is no shield, no cover uh, for the wine, but you can, it's very transparent, very, uh, easy to, to detect. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think um, as far as your three wines, you know, these three whites go. Um, so this is all the 2019 vintage. Um, Pinot Grigio, there's almost, there's, there's such an amazing texture. I love selling the Pinot Grigio because so many people just think it's a blah, it's a very boring grape. But your Pinot Grigio has so much fruit, so much roundness in the mouth, so much texture. There's almost tannin to it. There's, um, and, and at the same time, kind of more that stone fruit, apricot, peaches, um, a really lovely aromatic as well as, as, as robust on the, on the mouth. The, the Chardonnay is so linear. I love it. It, it, is, it has this wonderful, kind of clean acidity, more apple and pear um, and citrus tones to it. It's absolutely dynamite. I think the 2019 Chardonnay I am loving right now. It's, it's really been impressive. Uh, and then the Sauvignon Blanc is, is so Sauvignon Blanc. Um, for me, it kind of blends all worlds of Sauvignon Blanc where you have uh, very tropical notes to also, you know, I get, I, so I get like green papaya and green mango, but also I get some of that like hay or straw quality kind of grassy tones, as well as like kind of that, that cat peas zone of, of Sauvignon Blanc all melded together. And on the palate, even like this cooling eucalyptus note to it. I, I don't know, it, it, it just hit me right now in a different way. It, on the finish, it just is very cooling and, and almost uh, not menthol, but more eucalyptus style. Um, they're beautiful white wines and they're absolutely dynamite values as well. They're, they're amazing. Um, so yeah. let's, let's talk about reds. Um, I've got yes. Merlot, which is the reason why your father moved down to the Fosalta di Piave. And exactly. the Cabernet and the Rofosco. So first, tell me... Tell me how you make your red wines. And then second, let's talk about Redentore and what Redentore means. Yes. So red wines, uh, we produce them uh, in a very natural way. As I said to you before, we don't want to manipulate the grapes too much. Uh, we just hand pick the grapes like the whites. We bring them into the winery. We distend them. Uh, we don't do the crushing of the grapes, but the, the whole berry, goes into cement tanks. And there we have the fermentation and maceration together for about 15 days. So in, during this time, the color from the skins of the grapes goes into the juice and the, uh, the fermentation goes on. The yeasts do their work. We do the fermentation at a little higher temperature than the whites, uh, not too high because we want to maintain the flavors but we uh, a little higher. So in this way, we have a good extraction from the skins of the grapes. We want to go everything which is in the skin, which is the real taste of a red wine into the juice. And then after 15 days, we just pass it through the press. We separate the skins from the wine. And then at that point, the wine goes directly into the barrels. We use barrique and they stay normally around 12 months. 
we use only a small percentage of new oak in the red and torre wines we use used barrels because we want uh, not the impact of the oak overwhelming the wine but we want a good balance between oak and wine and the malolactic we do all the malolactic uh, in, in the red wines so there is no uh, malic acid and uh, it's it's done in barrique the malolactic is done in barrique the oak is very important to know that the oak is coming from we buy it from a supplier in france from bordeaux and the trees uh, are coming from Allier area in the central mountains of France. Uh, um, and the trees are older than 200 years. So very old trees. They are cut into tables. The tables are put outside at open air for 40 months. So during this long period, the rain wash away the bitter tannins. So only the sweet noble tannins stay in the oak. Then the barrel is done and is delivered to us. So uh, in this way, we have really very velvety tannins, very silky tannins. But what we pay a lot of attention to is the micro oxygenation, the, the air that goes through the oak into the wine, uh, mature the wine, develops the wine and make it ready and make uh, the wine open better. Uh, the tannins becomes rounder, smoother. The wine really is like, a, is like a flower that blossoms and opens and is really showing its best after aging in the oak. And then after we bottle the wine differently from Prosecco and the white wines, we keep the Redentore red wines in bottle for a few months before delivering because they need a little bit of aging. And even though these wines are without other sulfites, people might think this wine should be drunk quickly, but this is not true. You can age the red wines for 10, 15 years, no problem. The wine becomes better and better the tannins become smoother and the wines open more and more. Wow, wow. Yeah. So and the, the and Redentore. Yeah, 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 with, with De Stefani. So yeah, what are the differences between the grapes of De Stefani and yes. the grapes of Redentore? Yeah, De Stefani is the family name. We are basically using the older vi uh, vineyards, uh, whereas the Redentore is uh, this uh, line of wine we created for wines. The, uh, really, the identification of Redentore is wine with no added sulfites. Okay. And we are using different vineyards, uh, a little younger vineyard to make more fruity and more clean and more, let's say, easy drinking wine in the Redentore uh, line, whereas in the, the Stephanie have a little bit more complexity and, and aging potential. Um, and Redentore is, is, is very connected to the city of Venice, Venezia, where we are, uh, because uh, in, in 1600 there was the plague in Venice, which killed a lot of people. But after the plague was defeated, there was a big celebration in the city, and Redentore means the Redeemer. So it's like the redemption from this disease. And this is the meaning of Redentore. And every July in Venice, on the third weekend in July, there is a, the biggest celebration of the city of Venice with loads of uh, uh, dinners and parties and fire, uh, fire um, works in the city, celebrating really the Redentore, which is also the name of a church, which is in the Judeca Island, just in front of the main island of Venice. And it's basically the biggest celebration of the city of Venice. So we wanted to use this Venetian name for this wine and also the, the design of the label. Yeah. You know, the white and red uh, rhombus is basically uh, what is used in the old palaces in Venice. The floor of the old palaces has that design. And also that shape of bottle is a bottle that was used in the past in Venice, a little bit shorter bottle and fatter. It's typical and traditional to the city. Well, I mean, I, I love them. The, the, the whole style of these bottles is so good, but I think it's important to note it has a story. That it just isn't, yeah. and oh, I think this will sell. It actually has a lot of heritage to Venice, which is your family connection and ties. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Very special. Yeah. We want to keep this, this, this connection to the city of Venice. And in the red wines, what we want is, is fruitiness on, on one side to really smell the, the fruit of the grapes and the terroir, the soil where we grow the grapes, and also uh, aging in 
first in cement and then in the barrel. We want to give a little bit more complexity, good body, good structure, but making a smooth and round wine. And, and Alessandro, these red wines are so beautiful. Um, to kind of recap, the, the Merlot, so this is a 2017 Merlot, is, is our current vintage, and it is just lovely. It's, it's like supple. It's, it's kind of, the, it has wonderful structure, but not high tannins. It's, it's very, you know, there's wonderful blueberry and blackberry and kind of red spicy plum um, characteristics to it. The oak, it's so crazy that there's some new oak and only a few times used oak because it's so very well integrated. And I think your yeah. oaking program is a really spectacular oak program that oftentimes we hear new oak and we think it's a swear word. You know, it's, it's, the, it's a bad thing. But when it's done right, it's so integrated and really, really well built. Um, the Cabernet steps into the land of tannin and structure a little bit more. It has this this um, kind of dark fruit core, wonderful kind of brambly blackberry, boysenberry tones, but at the same time as having a really, an opposite character side with not pyrazine so much, not so green, but you feel, yeah. you feel the wholeness of the grape, that, that the stem, the, the, the fruit, the, 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 all aspects are coming together wonderfully. And then the Rafosco, Rafosco dal Peduncolo Rosso, um, this grape, I think, is so absolutely dynamite. Current vintage on the Cabernet is 2018, as well as the Rafosco 2018. Um, and the Rafosco, it's, it has this wonderful fruit, but it's more spicy in character, and, and the texture is so alive and, and vivacious. And I think we have such wonderful success with your Rafosco because it's unique to red wine for people at this price point and this, and this uh, palette, but it's, it's very approachable. It's still very drinkable and, and enjoyable, I think. So the, the, the red wines are absolutely gorgeous. I just realized that I don't have the Rebozo red, Red and Torre, um, yeah. but I do have stock of the Rebozo as well. And it's also really cool uh, 2016 vintage a little bit more muscle, a little bit more um, kind of grip and tannin and structure. It's really beautiful too. So um, these red and Tory reds are amazing. Um, yeah. And we should now get to the De, De Stephanie Cabernet. Yeah. De right. Stephanie Cabernet, you can see it's a different label uh, because it's a different line of wine. And uh, Cabernet, this Cabernet is coming from a vineyard which is just next to the uh, Pinot Grigio vineyard I showed you. Okay. It's the this vineyard was planted in 1984, so it's uh, 36 years old now. And uh, the vines are very thick, very close. We have two meters from one row to the other and 60 centimeters from one plant to the other plant. So we have basically 8,400 vines per hectare. Wow. So we want to have a low yield of grapes. For each plant, we have three, four, maximum five clusters of uh, grapes per plant in order to have, to have more concentration and to pick very ripe grapes. The picking is done between the end of September and the beginning of, of October, when still the thickness of the skin is there and the ripeness is there. Uh, the grapes are really very dark and very uh, ripe. We hand harvest, we have skin contact for 15 days, and then in this case also we have 12 months of oak aging also here a little bit of new oak and then used oak and um, then the wine in this case stays in bottle after uh, bottling the wine 12 months and we release it basically we release it between two to three years after the harvest okay. uh, what vintage do you have here brian 2015. okay 15 wow oh, amazing 15 amazing. was the great vintage in our area and uh, so this is a wine which is really with more character, great personality, and shows its best after five, six, eight years from the vintage. Well, and, and, for, and to, me, to me, when you have um, restaurants, Italian restaurants who know they need some grapes like Cabernet or Merlot on their wine list, this is next level Cabernet, or, you know, Cabernet that's just is giving me so much satisfaction. <clears throat> it's it has structure and it has tannin but it's also so smooth and so elegant it's very very elegant the fruit is is wonderful on the palate um 
And I think for Italian restaurants or people who love Cabernet, this is such a wonderful uh, other side to this grape, um, as well as <clears throat> your Chardonnay, your Sauvignon Blanc, your Merlot, your Cabernet on the Red and Tory line, yeah. Italian restaurant glass pour style for people who still want traditional, in their mind, grapes um, or grapes, international grapes, but so still very particular to the Veneto and your, your area, which is very neat. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Alessandro, remind me, um, tell me about filtering and fining. Do you fine? Do you filter? We fine all, only the white wines. We don't fine the red wines because there is no need to do it uh, because they stay, you know, it's a long aging. So when we bottle the wine, they have already been uh, decanted. They have already decanted all, everything in the wine. And we uh, do a slight filtering in the white wines and in the Prosecco, obviously we don't filter the red wines. So we don't want to, to take away anything from the reds because there is no need that we bottle them after one and a half years from the, from the harvest. So they have already you know, done all the work. We don't need to filter them. Yeah, yeah. No. Alessandro De Stefani, these, these wines are, are so lovely. Thank you for sharing them. Thank you for making them. Thank you for carrying on the torch of the family and passing it to your wonderful kids. Um, and you know, these, these wines are, have so much character and, and wonderful liveliness to them. And I hope everyone watching wants to try a few different new things that maybe they're not familiar yeah. with yet. And um, I really, really appreciate your time and your, everything you do. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian, for the great work you are doing, for the great work Bon Vivant is doing, and you guys. Uh, for distributing and having our wines and promoting our wines to your customers. Uh, we are really nothing without you. And uh, we do a lot of work here, but we need your support and your work also to have the wines available in the market. So thank you everybody. And I hope to see you all guys here in my winery. Whenever you come to Italy, let me know. You can visit the estate, you can visit the vineyard. We can taste the wines together in our family, and you can really uh, brief the, the Stephanie family and traditions here. So you are always very welcome. And thank you a lot. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>